Hi, I'm Drew Hutchison. You're tuned to Local Bias. We come to you from the studios of Greenfield Community Television at 393 Main Street in Greenfield. What a wonderful community resource. I'm so thankful that this studio is here so that I'm able to interview fascinating people in our own home town, basically, or, or our own area. And Carl Meyer, welcome to the show. Drew. Uh, you're our resident, or, or not just ours, Local Biases, but Franklin County's uh, journalist citizen journalist who's been covering the Connecticut River since time immemorial. Or immemorial. <laughs> immemorial. immemorial. So, uh, this is me, folks. And, <laughs> so, all right, then. Hi, so Drew. what's going on? This is really great. First of all, thanks for having me here. And um, this is probably the biggest river story uh, to come along, and it will be the biggest river story for decades. This is about the relicensing of the Connecticut River, the two projects, Northfield Mountain and Turner's Falls, Power Canal, and Cabot Station. This is eight miles of the Connecticut River. And I've been a stakeholder and a journalist in this process, somebody who would not sign a confidentiality agreement for the, since 2012. No, okay, so what, what's this conf confidentiality agreement? Well, that's when they get the stakeholders and the, and the federal agencies and the fisheries people to sign a, an agreement that if they can hammer out uh, a contract that FERC will sign, then you can figure out this license without FERC imposing conditions. And this is the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission license. But this is a big deal because Northfield Mountain and Turner's Falls have been basically an ecological disaster for the Connecticut River since uh, since time immemorial, since... Uh, since they were see. built, basically. Well, basically, a Northfield Mountain in particular has been and remains today this this the last vestige of the nuclear age on the Connecticut River, and it, it is the ugliest hangover. This is a, a situation where originally Northfield was built to run on the excess nuclear power created at Vermont Yankee and Haddam Neck and uh, Yankee Row could contribute. Oh, there was all this extra power, so they, they had this horrible idea, which would never, ever happen today, of... of hacking out a five billion gallon reservoir in Northfield, taking the energy that was hanging around on the wires because nuclear power was one big flash in the pan. At night, there was all this extra power, and we'll run the river up a mountain, fill mm -hmm. a reservoir, and then dump that power back on the lines as peak high price, peak price power during the daytime. Well, what this actually did, and what it is still doing with no more nuclear power, no more excess energy on the wires, is it actually, with all four pumps going, Northfield Mountain actually virtually pulls the river backwards, right. sucking in every bit of aquatic life that gets, gets into the suction cone. Uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and, and in, uh, in tandem with the state have been doing, doing some studies on the river. And the estimate is uh, Northfield Mountain probably sucks in and kills 15 million shad eggs and embryos per year and between one and two and a half million juvenile shad. And that's just for a single species. Northfield right. does this for everything. And, and the other piece of this is, is that um, this, is a, this is a way to make regenerate secondhand electricity that should never even be considered in the age of climate change. Northfield Mountain, the last two years, by their own, by their own data, has used up one third, sucks up one third more virgin power off the grid and holds it up in, up in their 15 billion gallon reservoir. They get paid on two markets, or two forward capacity markets, so they get paid for holding the water. Then they get paid for generating it, and now there is some new moves in the, in the generation market that seems like it, in the future it might allow them to generate any time of the day or night that they want to. So this becomes a cash cow even more and it's something that should have been challenged and taken offline when the nuclear plants went down. When the, I mean, Yankee Row closed now 
how many years ago? It's, it's, it's been 15, a while. it's, right. no, it's five years, I think. I think it, well, well these, anyway. the, the, but the thing is that it had been licensed before and the license is up for renewal, but this has been going on for six years or so? This is, oh, yeah, we started, we started this, the first meetings on, on the relicensing through this FERC Hydro Integrated Licensing Process, 2012, September 2012, we got tours of the plants, et cetera. And right from the get-go, and it was GDF Suez then, everybody buys this plant, wrings their money out of it, and then sells it again for a, mil a billion or two. So it was GDF Suez, and then two, getting closer to three years ago now, it was bought by First Light Power. Okay, and so you need to understand that, first of all, from the get-go, for these last six years, we have been negotiating Northfield Mountain and Turner's Falls Cabot Station. This is an eight mile section of the river, river that is run uh, through Turner's Falls Dam. The water is captured in this big pond to feed the massive water, water appetite for Northfield Mountain, but is also re-rinsed five miles downstream at the Turner's Falls Dam and re-peaked sending water through the, through the Cabot Station Canal, Turner's Falls Power Canal. Right, the Sushi Canal, as so, they call it. Exactly, so, so, so as soon as we started this relicensing, the power company said, we want to have just a single license. These plants, they're linked, and we, we just want to have you know, a single license going on into the future. That's my magic pen. Drew. It is magical. And, <laughs> but, but anyway, so but what, and, what's the, and, the advantage and, to having it linked? The, well, so you don't have one. to renegotiate it again. And also because the dam and Cabot Station for the last 20 to 25 years have been controlled through Northfield Mountain. They are virtually one one system. Okay, right? so you're not opposed to them being linked or being no, considered everybody, as... No, everybody for six years, we've been negotiating studies on this, fishery studies, and the towns have been sort of looking at the, the you know, the, the, the uh, taxability of these plants and the hardware that, that you get from these plants. And, you know, there are other interests on the river that have been sort of looking at. This is, this is billion dollar stuff going into the future, right? This is, a, this is one big cash cow. So here, this is why we're here, Drew. First Light Hydro Generating Company on December 20th, right? This is, this is a, a wholly owned Canadian Crown Corporation under Her Majesty, right? Known as, uh, what is it, uh, CPC Investments, Canadian Pension Sector Investments, right? That's, that's, they turned around and said, no, I'm sorry, dear FERC, we just registered two different limited liability corporations in the state of Delaware. So that one, they have no liability if something goes wrong? Is well, that, let me, let me okay. explain this. So one is, the, is they want, they want, one is registered as Northfield Mountain LLC, limited liability corporation. It, at that point, disappears under the, the monikers of four or five different First Light, LLC, holding company, this and that. You would never understand that this is a Canadian company now, right? Registered in Delaware, and the other one is Turner's Falls, and I can't remember the name of that LLC. So basically, they're turning around to all these people, all these towns, all these federal agencies, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Mass Division of Fisheries and Wildlife, um, National Marine Fisheries Service, everybody who's been doing these studies to protect the river, and the towns that, you know, the, the, these, the, these... This is our le legacy. These, this is our legacy. This is our environmental legacy. This, these, are, these are resources in our towns. And the towns get paid something for the ruination of the re these resources. And, and this, this stuff really is the last link to blocking an ecosystem restoration that's been going on since 1967 on the Silvio Conti. O. Conti National Fish and Wildlife Refuge, right? But they, didn't they change their mission because they stopped trying to force salmon well, that, yeah, that's a, but, but that is a sort of a, it's a dead issue now. And, okay. and now we're, we're, you know, the, the restoration has continued. It has always been about also shad and, and the herring, and they're sturgeon. supposed to be. Stur short nose sturgeon was not even in there, right? But they're but endangered. They, oh, yeah. So they're, they're, okay, so here are the rules that they're supposed to be, you know, this, these new buried corporations are supposed to be uh, healing to. Uh, you have you have the the Anatomist Fish Restoration Act, which was 1965 or something like that. There's the Federal Endangered Species Act. We have a one single anadromous, which means migratory fish on the Connecticut River, that is deeply and desperately impacted by the actions of Northfield Mountain and their control of the dam through Turner's Falls Power Canal. And then you have the Fish and Wildlife uh, Coordination Act, and then there are Mass DEP. 
uh, and, and fisheries laws, statutes. Well, so shouldn't it be pretty easy to demonstrate the ecological harm that has been caused by the practices at Northfield Mountain and then to say, well, look, this, the cost benefit is that you're getting all the benefit monetarily, but we're paying all the costs as a society. So that doesn't, sorry, that doesn't meet our mission. Well, well, their new move, and this is why I'm here, Drew, and this is sort of an emergency thing, that came on December 20th. It didn't appear to, to split the company, right? We've, okay. been, we've been working under these assumptions, and so has the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, doing all these studies. Everything would have to be split out and reevaluated and it is just such a kind of a creepy mood. And the only reason that anybody kind of knew about it is I sort of happened across it. I saw, I got a, a, a FERC notice on December 20th and I saw something, thought, thought something was amiss. But then I, I happened to, everybody reads the Federal Register, don't they? Sure, it's I riveting. think it was that January 6th or something and I realized that they have moved to do this, and they, they're asking for two new substitute applicants and an and, uh, uh, expedited transfer of license. For companies FERC. that didn't even exist before, from they've FERC. just been created on paper in order to shelter investors. Newly minted. Newly minted. Because that's what LLCs are good for. They're exactly. good for sheltering investors. Yes. Thank you, Canada. And uh, so, so I quickly sort of put the word out. I was on WHMP. I think there still may be a podcast out, but I quickly, because the Federal Register said that you had until January 15th to reply to this, this, this expedited, you know, sleight of hand thing that's going on. How can they expedite anything with the government closed? Well, thank you, Drew. So that's where we were at. So I quickly, if you go to carlmeyerwriting.com slash blog, I protested the FERC. I, and I, I wanted an intervention, and I protested on behalf of the fish. But I also said, you can't, you cannot have, you can't make a decision on this while all the main stakeholders, including U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, including National Marine Fisheries Service, are on furlough. So interesting enough, the day after, I think the, I, 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 my thing came came through the FERC registry and, and showed up in the public record on January 9th or January 8th, on January 9th, FERC turned around and, and put out a new, a new deadline. So the deadline became February 8th, okay? So, so every now and then you get to wag the dog. Drew, okay, you so know, you, nudged, kinda, you nudged so, them. So, so yeah, so, so if people are gonna hear this soon, you still have a chance to comment. And if you, you can find out how to comment if you go to carlmeyerwriting.com. Okay, so blog. that really will be the easiest place to find out what someone at home can do if they if they care about their river right and what they're we're leaving our children and future generations because you've been on the show enough now that I have learned how ridiculous it is the fact that these that the, the dam is still there and that the reservoir is still there uh, now I get that people in Irving paid pretty low taxes though they may not feel the same way that you and I do well there you go but I think at this point the people in Irving see this is this seems to be the strategy and you know you don't know what this is and like I said that you know in the end you always know it's about it's about money it's about taxes and it's about water okay and there haven't been any any sort of negotiations at the stakeholder table in months and there are, there are none planned at this time but I'm really sorry what bothers me a lot is to come on here and have to sort of re re sort of state what's going on on the river because it's not out there in the public there we the the public hasn't been brought along by well the river groups to be to be one I mean this is a river this is a four state river without a lawyer Right. You know, in a national fish and wildlife, there is not there is not an NGO that would be on another four state river that wouldn't have three lawyers on their staff. We don't have we don't we don't have, you know, the the watershed council and they're they're the conservancy now. They haven't brought people along. There was something called the Interbasin Transfer Act back in the mid '80s when I think Terry Blunt was the the Connecticut River Watershed Council director. They had people out in the streets. There were big meetings. The public doesn't know a thing about what's going on. I, you know, if you go to my, my little podcast on WHMP, this is something that Maura Healy ought to be looking into, the state ought to be looking into, Paul Mark, Natalie Blay, you know, Chamber of Commerce, because, because this is going to affect all those little towns. Now, they used to, th you know, they're, Irving and Northfield are where Northfield Mountain is, the okay. big bell ringer, the big cash cow, right? right. So what happens during the license is they throw a couple million their way and they're happy. You know, they're a small population, little towns. Right. But all the hardware that's got to go in because of the fish passage laws, that'll be down here. That'll be down here on what they want to call their little run of the river thing, aside from where they want to wring the money out and they want to sort of 
They want to play this up as an energy storage plant. Now, in the age of, of, um, of climate change and of, of uh, you know, solar panels and, and soft energy and wind power, this is the last thing that you, that you want to see. You don't want to see this mega grid stuff. You don't want to see a plant that's going to take eight minutes to, to pound out a bunch of energy when, when, when people are, should be looking at, at, at microgrids and uh, what, what do you call the integrated, uh, you know, sort of lo more localized grids right. and batteries. Well, well think batteries. about how Puerto Rico could recover from the hurricane if, they, if it hadn't had localized, if it had more localized energy. Exactly. You could and be this, up and running a lot faster. You know, but this is, this is a result of the short-sightedness of FERC and ISO New England and, and their inability to change. And this is also because the power companies write the laws. You know, the, the Public Utilities Holding Act has been amended and amended, and this is why they, they, they may get to get away with hiding their, their company and, and turning into two different things. But there ought to be lawyers working on this because this is going to affect going forward for generations, not only the Connecticut River, which would benefit by a quarter million shad passing Turner's Falls every year, which is the estimate of the number of shad that reach Turner's Falls. You know how many get through? Maybe three in a hundred. 10 in 100, one year or another. And when those that's fish- a loss of, That's a loss of biodiversity, but also economic value to people that, let's say I wanted to go fishing for shad. I mean, people used to be able to feed themselves it's out fantastic. of the Connecticut River. We it, can't do that right now. It is what lit a fire under me, seeing all those fish past Holyoke. There's an average of 316,000 over, over, since 1976 that have passed Holyoke. Each 80 year. 80% of those fish reach the Turner's Falls Northfield Mountain project, the to big project, that and, spit up and, and they do not get past. The few that do get past, 73 percent last year, 73 percent of the, those fish that made it through here were able to go up past Vernon Dam. And this is a four-state So this is the bottleneck right now. This is actually the problem, and they're looking. This is the strangulation. Right. This really is. It's it's devastation on the river. And uh, like I said, it should have been shut down a long time ago, but the public really, you know, sort They've of They've been remains. asleep on this. It's not, it, but it's not their fault. You know, it's really the people, you know, the people that, that are claiming that, you know, they're the river protectors. Well, they're, they're going for the low hanging fruit, but you know, they don't have the resources. They haven't brought people along and they, you know, they haven't organized people. So this all gets done under the table. So I alone, Ishmael right. or whatever, get to right. tell the tale, right? Because I didn't sign some stupid piece of paper. Um, but. Uh, this is just, it, it is just a poke in the eye to everybody. People are aghast. The fish and wildlife people, and I've run into uh, one or two of them on the road. They've stopped to shake my hand and, and said thank, thank you, for, you for, for putting the letter into FERC, which you can get at carlmeyerwriting.com slash blog. Um, but they, you know, they feel helpless right now, you know. But other than that, I think the Franklin County towns are, are getting together and evaluating this. This is, this is just, this seems like a really insidious. So the towns move. are getting together, so they're aware of it's my it. understanding that they are. I mean, I, you know, I haven't been uh, in contact with any of them because they're all signatories on the, um, you know, so I, I, you know, I pick up what I can off the street. Um, but they're all signatories because they were all trying to negotiate, uh, you know, a, a settlement agreement outside of the FERC thing. But this has been going on now for six years. There should have been a license signed on April 30th. So they're operating 2018. right now. With they're a operating on an extended license at FERC. At a certain point, I hope FERC even gets tired of this. So, you know, but, I, you know, I have to call into question, you know, Neil Chatterjee and FERC who showed up with Scott Pruitt at Northfield yes. Mountain last year. So uh, I do hope that the teachers and the schools that go up to Northfield Mountain for their little environmental school programs every time start asking questions about why, are you, why are you killing our river on behalf of the Canadian government? I mean, this is basically an inter-transfer, inter-basin transfer of money and electricity. That electricity is not getting used here, Drew, right. the, the, what, the, what, they, what they put out. And meanwhile, our ecosystem is being destroyed. Exactly. And, and what is the gem? Where do we all live? We live in the Connecticut River Valley. Right. Where is the Connecticut River at its most dead? It's in the eight miles between Northfield Mountain and the end of Turner's Falls at the Rock Dam. Right. where the only naturally, naturally <laughs> confirmed spawning site for the Connecticut River short nose sturgeon is. So what's been happening with the sturgeon? I remember you had Dr. Boyd Kennard on a few years ago, yes. and, he, and he's an expert on short nose sturgeon. So the fact that it's, that is the one spot that it 
That, that's the only known natural spawning site, right? So, and and it's starved every year, right? Even this year. If you look on my blog site, it shows you a picture. I think it's May 12th. It was Mother's Day of last year. There's, there's just all these cobbles where, where, the, where the fish would be able to spawn if there was actually water there. There's a fisherman way up there, but the, the fish would spawn in that pool and, and their, the embryos and eggs would, would find their way underneath these cobbles. They're all high and dry. But the thing is, spawning takes place during a very defined period of time. It's not like it happens all year, year long. Right. And, you know, and, and so, so this is what, what's been being negotiated at this settlement table. But then these guys come along and uh, Northfield Mountain LLC, First Light CPC Investments and the Canadian Account Corporation want to make a new, whole new ball game. So what's going on with the short nose sturgeon? They got skunked last year, if you, if you take a look at my website. Okay. Um, there is some new uh, investigation going on upstream because they found, and I think we talked about this on your show, I reported that at Vernon, somebody actually caught a fisherman, caught a short nose sturgeon, and they were never, ever thought to exist upstream of Turner's Falls. So there's going to be some investigations. There's something called uh, eDNA testing, where you can test waters. And this gets a little woo-woo to me, but you get some water, and you can actually find out if, if, if there's any, of, any little biological cells from short-nosed sturgeon in stretches of the river. So they're going to do some more of that up to, I think, all the way up to Bellows Falls. And, and, and Northfield Mountain and Turnus Falls operations actually impact 55 miles of this river. You know, up into what? Is it Wyndham County is the next county of Vermont? Mm -hmm. Franklin, Hampshire, all the way down through Northampton. And when the operators at Holyoke Dam, I think it's about eight hours. When Northfield sneezes, they have to wait for the, for the, for the, for the flow to blow through in the <laughs> about eight hours later. So this is such, a, such a, an impediment and such an inhalation and such a grim, grim politics on this river. But, but I suppose it, it seems to me like because they're the big boys and they're used to getting their way, they're probably going to get their way. But is there, is there a way to, to make it so that the damage is mitigated by, for instance, during this particular stretch of the season, Northfield, it's, just, it's off. Sorry, investors, but there's going to be a month here every year where we just let the river flow as it should. Two that, or three months is three what months? there ought to be. But okay. I mean, the, the truth of the matter is, is it's a dinosaur, and, and there should have been... The information should have been studied and put out, you know, by the state. The Commonwealth has been behind the ball on this, and so was the Watershed Council. Let's face it, they didn't do their homework. Um, but that's what settlement talks, that's, that's what we've been working on for six years. What are going to be the well, conditions? It, okay, so I don't... You don't understand, six years. Drew? You don't, six years? It's, it's hard to understand. Well, six years and... Oh, by the way, we want, you to, we want you to negotiate with two different companies operating under two different parameters and clouded and wholly clouded by our financial, you know, we're going to Basically, we're gonna they created our, front men. Yeah. They've created front men. You know, so... You so, do that when you're trying to launder something. Well, thank you very much, Drew. That's, that's, that's good. You know, so this is, this is money for executives and, you know, shareholders that are in Canada and a few execs that are out in Burlington, Mass. And, you know, they, they have their, their K Street law firm or wherever it is down in D.C. And, you know, it, the money is... But it is not going to a river that has you know, has not seen its due and has been owed its fish and ecological restoration since 1967. Since okay, okay so let's, all right, so then for the sake of argument, let's say that somehow the powers that be that are negotiating this FERC goes, you know what, this just doesn't make sense. Carl Meyer's right, it's a dinosaur. It's just making money for very few and it's causing all this harm. Best of all worlds, people. So what would happen if that happened? What would happen to the Connecticut River if it was allowed to actually function as the Connecticut River and not have this artificial sucking backwards for miles and miles every night? Wow. You know, that's an amazing question. And it's, 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 it's got, my eyes kind of get big thinking about it. But two years ago, 2017, the Connecticut River had its largest run of shad ever. Oh, 500, they had the silt? 514,000 shad past Holyoke. Those fish... 80% of them, which would be, well, I mean, you know, even if you took the 316,000 to come up every year average, 
quarter million fish passing Turner's Falls. Because it was shut down during that because, time. Because not even because it was shut down. Well, I, I thought you were talking about the whole the whole thing off, but right. but I mean that's it. You know, under law, they have been entitled to this since 1872. Landmark Supreme Court decision about the Connecticut River, Holyoke Company versus Lyman. The power com dam owners are are required to pass and protect upstream and downstream migratory fish passage. That's law. This is because of they the little have, people. Okay, this so that's law. That's case law. That is, yes it is. You can look that up and right now. And it's demonstrable that they have not done so. Oh, it's more than demonstrable, right? But they've been locked into this license for the last 40 years, so you could not move this along. Now, Canada but, wants to jump in three years ago and buy a license. Well, fine. You have, you have taken over a license where you have the right to lease some water. A new license negotiates how much of our water the public is going to make available to you, how, when it's going to be available to you, and at what cost. But how can you even allow a license to be written that violates the law? So if, if they're saying, yeah, we're going to let you take all this water, but it's actually harming the fish, and the law says that the fish need to be protected, then that contract should be no good. Well, it these, be are, these are, this is why there should be lawyers involved on the ecological side and also on the town side, because because those are valuable resources to all of us. Now, there are also, I mean, uh, well, there's a movie about, about uh, out about uh, Dick Cheney. I mean, energy <laughs> laws got rewritten a lot right. by the, by the power companies, you know, right. back in what, 05 or so, you know, so there are, there are these little ins and outs, but if you are a, an international corporation coming to work on our river that has been governed by these laws for all this time, the expectation and the legal precedent is that now you have to pass our fish and protect our ecosystem. Right. And that's what we because are here to tell Because you can't plead ignorance at this point if you raise it. No, but you can, but you can plead LLC. Mm. I'd, oh my God, I cut my leg off, which is a little turn as falls. It's over there, so I can't run anymore. Look at that, I'm poor. I can't, I, I don't have the money to put in a fish ladder. Meanwhile, the other hand behind your back is just wringing money out of what they thought was a nice cash cow for the good people of Canada. And don't get me wrong, I love Canada. Oh, Canada. I just, you know, but you know, nobody should do this internationally. I hope we're not doing it on their river. But I'm hoping that FERC says, sorry, too late in the game. You cannot split these assets until we have this license complete. And then if you want to sell a piece of this, you go ahead. But the laws are the laws. All right. And we have to end it there because we've breezed True. through this, as always. You're the man. <laughs> I'm the man. There you go. Um, and you're the audience. Thank you for tuning in. This show would mean nothing without you, the viewer. And you can watch this online. It will be uh, eventually at gctv.org. I will also be posting it to hadleymedia.org. I'm Drew Hutchison. Carl Meyer, thank, thank you. you. Take care. Well done. Yeah, well, you, I just wind you up. As just you. listen.